Hello and welcome back to Quick Minderpod, an Icelandic cinema podcast. I'm Rob Watts, and on this podcast I discuss 21st century Icelandic film with my good friend Ellie Cawthorn. I can't quite believe it, but it's our final trip through the films of Iceland for series two. We hope you've enjoyed all the episodes this time round, including our bonus London Film Festival episode and our Halloween episode featuring Mike Munzer from The Evolution of Horror. We've had a great time delving further into what makes Icelandic films so Icelandic and have been really enjoying chatting about them on our social media channels. I've now added even more films to the list for further series, so thanks to all of you for your recommendations. Once again, a big thank you to Nordic Watchlist for being our biggest fans and featuring us on their fantastic site, to Mike for his guest appearance, and to everyone who has supported us with Kvik Minderpod throughout the last year. We'll be taking a break for a bit, but we will be back. So why not, in the meantime, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, where we are at Kvik Minderpod, that's K-V-I-K-M-Y-N-D-A-P-O-D, leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, and catch up with any episodes or films you might have missed. I will update our pinned tweet to highlight where all the films we've covered can be found. Right, we're ending this series with another brilliant drama, this time set on the Rakyanus Peninsula. Isold Ugodotirs and Breathe Normally, or Andith Ethileia from 2018, follows two women with different backgrounds, forming a relationship via passport control. This film deals beautifully with issues surrounding immigration, unemployment and family, and looks stunning, if incredibly bleak. And so, for the last time, hey Ellie. Hello Rob. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Not so bad, thanks. We made it to the final week again. We finally made it. I know. I can't quite believe it, that our heads haven't fallen off yet. No. I mean, so much Iceland clattering around inside. (laughs) Yeah, I went to a pub quiz on Tuesday and there was a picture round which was flags. Oh, yeah. And the Icelandic flag was on there. Please tell me you got it right. Got our team a point. Don't worry about it. Perfect. If, if nothing else, I mean, that's like the base level of Iceland knowledge. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you got it right. I'm terrible at flags too, so. No Iceland films popped up. No, I don't think I've ever seen an Iceland <laughs> film in a pub quiz of you. No, no. There's always a first time though. Any pub quiz masters out there, Get it in. When we know one. <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> we do. Um, fantastic. Well, you know, we're not ending with quite the same film as we ended series one. This is And Breathe Normally from 2018 uh, in Icelandic. That's Andith Elilea by director Isold Ugadotir, our first female director whoop, of whoop. a fi- fictional feature film. Very good. Nice to see it. Yes, we love to see it. And it's been too long. It has been too long um, and hopefully, you know, we'll start seeing more films by f- female directors. And and I think you you can probably see that in the film in that there's two amazing central female leads mm-hmm. that are incredible and very sensitively portrayed. So I, it makes sense to me that a woman directed it. Have I given away my thoughts and feelings about the film already? <laughs> Uh, a little bit, but that's fine. We we like to hear it, um, and we can we can talk about it further as we go on. I'll start with a synopsis, and then we can get into talking about those two leads that you just mentioned. So, Laura, a single mother and former addict, is struggling for food and rent when she's offered a trainee post with the border police. During her training, she spots a forged passport being used by a lady named Adja. What is great work for Laura separates Adja from her family and lands her a prison sentence, followed by a stint at a centre for refugees. As Laura moves out of her flat and into her car with her son Eldar, the women form an unlikely friendship and realise they may be able to help each other out. Mm. Mm. Nice summary.
And there you go. We've got Laura and Adja. Mm-hmm. And Laura is played by Kristin Thora Haraldsdottir. Who we have seen before. We have. As the older Magnea in Let Me Fall, right? That's the one. Another addict. Another addict. Another down on her luck mm. young lady. I would say Laura is in a slightly better position. Yeah. Though, you know, it's not an easy life mm-hmm. as we see. But we've also got Babadita Sadjo playing Adja, who we've mm. we've not seen at all. Who I think is Belgian, right? Not I believe Icelandic. I believe so. Yeah, and I've I don't think I've seen her in anything else. No, nor uh, had up I to this point. But there are two leads, so let's talk about Laura first. So she's yeah, she's a single mother with a young son called Elder, and he's a little blonde child, like many we've seen in the past. And he kind of brings this naive look yeah. at the world, doesn't he? Which is a nice counterpoint to the grim reality, I think. Yes. Um, and it means that there's there's kind of a bit of momentum in that she's always got to keep up this illusion of it being, we're going to live in the car, which is an adventure. We're going to mm-hmm. um, go and ask these people for help or steal free samples. It's all an adventure. It's an adventure, which I think is a nice conceit. Yes, it is. I mean, it's not much of an adventure, though, is it? Like, even I don't think Elder even thinks it's an adventure, really. It's like, mm. when are we going on this adventure? Mm. Um, but all those things you just mentioned, you know, it, her life is not great. It's hard. The film opens and we see her not being able to afford everything she's bought mm. at the grocery store, which is bonus. I thought that was a really strong opening scene, actually, in that it basically told you everything you needed to know in one really easy exchange because she says, can you put some of it on my card? And then she's Mm -hmm. rattling around for the rest in her purse and kind of dishing out little bit change to try and cover just the the weekly shop, we presume. And from that scene, you're like, right, I get her situation. I know what's going on. Yeah, because she doesn't have, she doesn't even have enough to buy the toilet roll. And she refuses the offer of, you know, a few pence from another from a stranger and you're right like she's she's proud obviously Uh, she doesn't want to take help but she is struggling i think we're very much back to the we're very much back to the iceland here of uh let me fall aren't we this slightly more bleak well much more bleak depressing modern image of the of the nation that's not just you know mountains and valleys and rivers and even the opening sequence of it, we get kind of um, aerial shots, don't we? But they're not of beautiful landscapes. They're of like bleak tower block, social housing, yeah. um, roads that just have like some kind of slightly depressing concrete stuff on them. So it sets it up from the start as something a bit different. It really does. Yeah. I mean, it, the film itself does look beautiful. It's shot stunningly but we're not looking at the mountains we're not looking at the rivers and we're not looking at the volcanoes we're looking at the Reykjanes Peninsula which is you know it's an it's about an hour from Reykjavik it's not that far it's down near the airport Mm. and it's basically the airport road seems to make a lot of appearances (laughs) in these films I never knew that I'd be so familiar with um just the road to an airport (laughs) who knew who knew you gotta get in and out of this country there's one way in and one way out and uh, yeah, the airport's the place. But yes, the Re- the Reykjanes Peninsula itself, according to the Bureau of Statistics of Iceland, it has the highest percentage of evicted Icelanders in the country. Ah, okay. There's also a lot of drug issues and drug problems down there. And many of the airport staff live in Reykjanes as well. So just from that simple sentence about the area, mm. we know, well, it translates to what we see on film as well, doesn't it? Because... Laura's struggling, but she's also a former addict mm-hmm. or an addict. And we learn that she lost custody of her son at one point as well. Yeah. So it's a few battles she's facing, really, isn't it? Certainly is. But she does get some good news at the start, along with all the notices that come through the post about how much she owes and how time's run out for her rent and, and all of these things. She gets a, a letter from the border police saying, come and train with us, which is exciting. And she's obviously very much in need of that. Yeah. I mean, that job is portrayed as a real lifeline, isn't it? And I think that that's a necessary part of the the narrative because she's not joining the border police because she hates immigration and wants to crack down, is it? Is she? She's joining because she needs a way to pay her rent and a way to feed her son, mm-hmm. which clearly she doesn't have at the moment. So 
I think that's an important thing that runs through the the whole film. It's a terrifying situation, isn't it? Imagine yourself in that situation of literally nowhere to turn and you can't afford to rent somewhere or stay in a room with your child. No, it's awful. She tries to live with a former drug friend, dealer, don't know who he is, played by Thorstein Bachmann. <laughs> yeah. In, in his least likable role, I would say. Yeah. That we've, that we've seen. His character in Catler is horrible. <laughs> but she can't even find, he can't even find room for her there because of Elder. And so they, yeah, they sleep in the car next to the airport. I mean, it's the most bleak existence. I don't know if you've ever slept in your car, but it is cold at the best of times, let alone in the winter of Iceland. I'm trying to think if I ever have slept in my car. And I don't think I have. I don't think I've ever had to. Lucky you. <laughs> when have you I slept mean, in a car? My story isn't sad. My story is <laughs> when being you were drunk. evicted from your last home. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully not, no. Just a night when I didn't have anywhere to stay after a night out because reasons. Oh. Um and it's just so cold. Oh yeah. So cold and uncomfortable. And you you know, it's gonna be even colder in the open, windy mm. areas of Iceland. Yeah, I, I could feel that. You can see the breath coming out. You can feel the wind. You can hear the wind. It's, it's a horrible existence. But she does have this lifeline of the job, which is where she meets Adja, our other lead character. Mm. And quite a... Um, in a not very heralded scene, it's not like, toot toot, beep beep, here's going to be our new um, other main character, is it? No. It's the the focus of that scene is really, really on Laura and Adja kind of just slips in and suddenly we're like, oh, who's that? And then before you know it, she's the main character. Yeah, it's, it's crazy because we're watching Laura do her job or learn to do her job. And the guy who's actually doing his job is not doing his job very well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was thinking, right, if I ever need to um, get out of this country, Iceland seems like a good bet because the... Uh, the border security was not very not very intense, was it? It's true. It made me think, is that what it's like internationally? But I guess so. People get over borders all the time, don't they? Yeah, I don't know. But we learn in this film that Iceland is part of something called the Schengen area. Which... Oh, the Schengen oh, area. Yeah. The Schengen Do you know area. what? I had heard of that term, but I didn't know what it meant. Had you? I think so. Because there... <laughs> I'm just She's... saying that. I mean, I don't know whether Laura did. She's learning about it in her training. But I was like, right, pause film. What the hell is the Schengen area? Turns out, and I mean, I read a lot and I didn't understand most of it. <laughs> but it's a group of 26 countries in Europe or the EU that have abolished all passport and all other types of border control at their mutual borders. So mm -hmm. I guess beyond just showing a passport, there's nothing else there Easy if you're traveling within those countries now i don't know if that applies to adja because she's come from guinea bissau but we're not sure about whether she's come from guinea bissau via france for example because yeah. she that's her kind of cover story isn't it that she's french or that she's got into the schengen area <laughs> some other way and then come across through that yeah it's it's unclear but if she has come through the schengen area then she should basically that should be the easiest passage for her but unfortunately laura is there trying to do her job well trying to impress and she catches her out mm. it's yellow not blue who knew who knew any passport forgers out there can take a few tips yeah Next, please. Boarding pass and passport, please. Yeah. Take a go on profile. Alta horo mintina. Kikia. Sit up with scanna. Alta. So it's probably a kakna grunning skiller. Or if there is anything that you feel to, you can just kick your head and fly. Out for blue and rose. Is that the French day up here? I have my own flu liu mati leg. I'm just saying that. And so there is the outfit skiller. Thank you very much. Have a nice journey. But this is bad news for Adja because she's traveling 
from Guinea-Bissau trying to get to Canada. And we learn very quickly that she was traveling with two other people, one of whom was her daughter, mm. that she denies she denies traveling with anyone, which is very good for her because she obviously doesn't want the others not making it to Canada. But she, yeah, she gets taken and interrogated almost upstairs mm. at the airport. That scene was really tense, wasn't it? Where I think actually all the people, apart from Laura, who work at the border police, well, the police section of it, at least at the start, are quite cold and mm. intimidating. There's the guy um, in the interrogation room yeah. who um, I just says to him, you know, like, do you know how long this is going to take? And he just kind of ignores her totally, like really cold shoulders mm. her. There's the guy in the car on the way to the detention center who says, Laura says, you know, how long are they going to be that? How long might she be there? What might happen to her? And he's kind of like, oh, I don't know. Like he hasn't even had any thought about the human impact of his job at all. Not at all. And he he basically says, well, she broke the law and that's that. He doesn't yeah. think about doesn't it. doesn't think about that. the nuance no. of the situation. No. Bloody Svein Gerson. <laughs> <laughs> Our medium lawyer from I Remember You. <laughs> but it's I think that's he's kind of the voice of probably the majority of us. You know, I, I can't say I've ever really thought about the intricacies of immigration and refugee status and things like that. You just assume that what's in place, you know, is correct. And Laura is exactly the same. She's learning about it and we're learning with her, essentially. Yeah. Um, and also Adja. And I think the the film does a really interesting job of showing the system of immigration as kind of like death by bureaucracy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So nobody's actively cruel. Nobody's like um, malicious or anything. Everyone in the system kind of says, sorry, them's the rules. I didn't make up the rules. It's just the system. It's just, it's just the procedure. System. Yeah. And it's almost like Brazil, you know, with the bureaucracy that just ties itself in knots and mm -hmm. there's no escape. Um, when I'd just like, so can I claim asylum in Canada? And they're like, well, no, because you're not in Canada. How can I get to Canada? You can't get to Canada because you don't have a passport. Well, how do I get a passport? You can't get back. You know, the mm -hmm. the absolute just vicious circles of it is kind of more terrifying than if people were cruel somehow. It's, it's terrible, especially that caseworker that she speaks to. It's just like, you've just got to sit and wait. Mm. And, you know, she... She has to present a reason for claiming refugee status that she doesn't have that much evidence of. Mm. Um, we learn that she was she's being persecuted back home for her sexuality, but it's left up to you know four random white Icelanders, who you know Iceland's a pretty open country in terms of gender and sexuality and stuff, mm. to make this decision. You know whether she is in danger if she goes home. And I guess it's like she says as well, how, I can't prove that, like how, what evidence am I meant to have? Presumably if in Guinea-Bissau, um, same-sex relationships are have to be clandestine because, you know, they they get you in trouble, mm -hmm. then why would you have a load of documents proving it? It's exactly. an impossible situation. Yeah, it's awful. But yeah, we'll come to towards the end in a minute. And, uh, Hvað heldur að vera Já. Uh, ég veit so Laura and Adja meet in this kind of awful scenario and neither of them is living a particularly enjoyable life. Adja gets sent to prison where she, her lawyer tells her she'll probably only serve half the sentence and refuses to take the money that she offers to pay him, which I guess is something, but only because he knows that he's literally had to do nothing and 
won't do anything for her, which is quite sad. Doesn't he say the the state will bill you? Is that what he says? Yeah. Oh, God. Well, that's even worse. <laughs> yeah. I didn't remember that. I thought yeah. he was just like, no, leave Which your money. Which some, is somehow more bleak because it's b- feeding back into the bureaucracy aspect, isn't I, it? I thought that he said the state will bill him. Oh, I'm not sure. I hope it's that they'll bill him and not her. Yeah. God. But she, yeah, so she ends up in prison. Uh, not Little Heroin that we've seen in previous films. Another smaller prison, which looks more like a school, but it's mm. still prison. But then she gets out of there and ends up in a refugee centre, mm. which also, I mean, what is that place? It just looks bleak, isn't it? It's kind of just a, bo- a boarding house type of situation. Yeah. Almost like a halfway house, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't look like the worst no. place in the world. It's certainly tidy and clean, but it does sort of feel like they're just being dumped there and, you know, you're here until you're not here. And it's quite chaotic, isn't it? There's people shouting and playing games and Mm -hmm. you can imagine when you're in like huge turmoil because you've been separated from your family and you don't know what your future is going to be you might be deported that that is not where you want to find yourself no and it's interesting because she's like who do i need to check with about going out to the shops and stuff and the taxi driver who we have seen previously on quick pod i can't place him at all have we very briefly, he's quite very briefly, he's quite distinctive. He's the big guy who asks for some coffee when he delivers the lamb to. Oh to my god! I meant to remember literally a person who comes and says, "Here's your lamb. Can I have some coffee?" Okay, I'm off now. Yes, I'm not a walking IMDb page. <laughs> well, you should be after this <laughs> for Iceland and I I M D B. But yes, yeah, so the taxi driver played by Gunnar Jonsson. He basically says, oh, no, you're not in prison. Not the kind with bars. bars anymore. And, I mean, that's it, isn't it? Like, she's mm. stuck. She's just stuck. And also, you get the sense that it's, like, literally next to the airport. My main issue with the airport security is not the passport control. No? It's the um, just lax fencing around the airport perimeter. Yeah, it's quite, like you know, old, old school fencing that you could just easily <laughs> yeah. climb over. Yeah. Um. So we see Adja kind of wandering around there, don't we? And anywhere we see her definitely has a bleak vibe. You get the sense that she's just been like plopped into this boarding house in the middle of nowhere. So yeah, you can leave. Yeah, you can go around. But what are you going to do? You're not exactly going to go um, sightseeing, are you? Well, no, and no one's there to be like, so... This is where you are. This is what you could go and do. Like, she's not going to be able to get a job. She's not going to be able to afford very much because she's got like 10 kroner on a bonus card and, you know, whatever money she came with, which she does use eventually. Um, She's just this sort of random person, like you say, plopped like the little yellow man on Google Maps, just like (laughs) dropped into the center of Iceland with no real clue as to what comes next. You'll be comfortable here, yes? Mm-hmm. Here's your information. Someone will come and tell you how everything works here. And here's your bonus card. It has a tiny amount, so you can buy some food. It, it's not a lot. Thank you. Does someone need to go with me? No, you're not in prison anymore. You know the kind with bars anyway. Can I ask? Yes. Do you know how long I have to stay here? No, I I don't know. It's, It's just a system. But good luck to you. Thank you. I guess then we see the parallels between her and Laura in that it's that lack of 
options and lack mm. of freedoms. So yeah, you could go anywhere, but you can't if you don't have money or you can't if you don't have a passport. And both of them are really constrained by poverty and by lack of immigration status. Yeah, by the government systems, basically. Mm. Like you said, the bureaucracy. It's just They've just trapped, neither of them actually in prison, but they re- really are kind of hemmed in by the laws and the systems in place that mean, yeah, that Laura doesn't have anywhere to live and she, yeah, neither of them have anywhere to live. It's just, yeah, pretty grim. That whole thing, that whole situation is quite explicitly um, conveyed in the early scene through the metaphor of the cats in the cat's home. Oh, Don't you yeah. think? Oh, yeah, of course. Because um, Eldar, the, the child, says... Mm. Isn't it strange to live in a cage? Look at the mummy, all those cats living in cages. Yeah. Yeah. Can't they just look after themselves? No, they're not allowed to look after themselves. I guess someone decided it. Mm. And I mean, that's essentially the whole thing is like, why is Adja in that refugee centre and not in Canada safe? Because someone decided that she wasn't free to go because of her... Well, obviously there are laws and passports and things, but because of her status back home that they don't believe Mm. it's good that you brought up that metaphor because i think it comes in almost before you know what the film is going to be really all about exactly and then i guess if you have a second viewing it makes a lot more it's a lot more resonant it's very clear from the beginning yeah i must say on second view they go there and even to the point where they go to take the cat and the lady behind the counter is like no that's going to cost you quite a lot of money to take the cat and laura's obviously got no money she's like well People actually pay to take the cats away from you. (laughs) And the woman's like, yes, but then lets them have it, which is basically the end of the film. Yeah. Ooh, interesting. Okay. I thought that whole, the whole cat thing, the cat's called Moosey. Moosey, dear. (laughs) And again, it it provides the the demonstration of how sort of poor they are, because at one point Elder's even eating like the cat food the cat candy calls it i think that's just because he's like that's what kids do isn't it eat I, cat food do they my friend um followed her cat round as a, as a little baby as a toddler and ate cat food out the bowl because the cat did oh <laughs> that's so horrible um that's really horrible but okay i mean the other friend didn't want to eat it he's the same age what you think because he, he was middle class he didn't want to eat the cat food no, I just think he just thought it was disgusting. <laughs> and Elder's only eating it because he's hungry. Oh, right, um, yeah. There was that story a few years ago of the lady who bought her kids advent calendars, chocolate advent calendars. And they, they couldn't understand why all the kids were getting sick. And it turned <laughs> out that she'd bought calendars for cats. <laughs> <laughs> and instead of chocolate behind every door, it was catnip. <laughs> That is so good. And she didn't realise that it looked weird. No, because it looked like an advent calendar for a normal human being. But it actually had catnip behind all the doors and they were eating that. (laughs) Children are so dumb. (laughs) I mean, parents can be dumb also. Elder loves Moosey very much, instantly. And he's there when they're in the car. Obviously, Moosey's got nowhere else to go. But one morning, Elder lets him out of the car. I thought Moosey was a girl. Oh, probably. I don't know. How patriarchal <laughs> of you to assume that Moosey the Hang cat on. was How- a man. You're the one who assumed he was a- she was a girl as well? I assumed she was a girl because he called her Moosey dear. Oh, well, so you're being sexist too. You can't call them <laughs> yeah, a, a that's male true. animal You caught me in my own trap. <laughs> but, um, well, Moosey, gender neutral Moosey. Yes. Escapes. Why did he let Moosey out of the car? Because he's never had a cat before. Mm. He doesn't understand. He's, like I said, he's the naive presence asking the obvious questions that mm. there are no clear answers to in the stupid world of bureaucracy. An adult. Mm-hmm. 
so he just lets the cat out because the cat needs a wee. Mm. Unfortunately, then the cat goes missing. Oh, but it does provide the context in which Adja and Laura meet each other mm-hmm. because Adja finds a cat and Elder. So after she's gone racing around looking for Elder, I mean, Laura looking around for Elder is... Very oh, stressful. So stressful. And like you said, it's not a nice environment to be in. She's mm-hmm. like driving this tiny little tin bu- tin can car around the most just desolate landscape. Mm. I am um, what I liked about that interaction where the two women meet again for the first time after obviously Laura has essentially got Adja stuck in the detention center mm. was that and it actually it took a while as well that they were quite kind of combative and it's not like they met and immediately Laura was like, oh, it's you. I feel so bad. Let's be friends. Mm. They Their relationship was very standoffish. And it was for quite a long time, which I liked. Yeah, a little bit saccharine. like um, like in a cowboy film where they're just like squinting at each other. Yeah. Like hands poised on the trigger. But actually, they neither of them can do anything. Mm. Although so, so they think. But actually, they, they can help each other out mm. in the long run. So when they do finally meet, it's again, it's Elder who's like, are you going to offer a lift? Mm. She's walking on her own, <laughs> you know, by an airport. Like, that's not <laughs> normal. Give her a lift and take her home. She's probably cold, which, yes, yeah, she would be. So I really like that, that, you know, Laura does have a heart, but she does need it to be sort of Coaxed warmed out. up by her son. Yeah. I think their relationship generally is really nice in terms of that a lot of time... You know, poverty and desperation can break people apart and break communities apart. But they found strength, didn't they? And found a way to overcome their dire situation by teaming up. Yeah, and I think Laura offers this lift, but it's sort of Adja who really provides mm. the the first big helping hand, which is by letting Laura and, and Elda sleep in her box room at the refugee centre. Whoever is like overseeing this refugee centre is doing it. A- a terrible job <laughs> yeah I, it does strike me that you know Maybe there isn't much the yeah there isn't much funding um, or anything i guess yeah no structure to mm. the whole thing it's like these people turn up and then at some point someone comes and grabs them in the night but mm. that period in the middle is sort of just like limbo because mm. they don't know what they're doing and no one else seems to care or know either and that's quite sad but yeah what is really heartwarming is that they start they, they form this relationship where they start to help each other out. Mm. They learn about each other's lives a little bit because they couldn't be as couldn't really be any further removed in terms of their the places they've grown up and, mm. and started their lives to get to this point. I can't imagine there's much in Guinea-Bissau that resembles the Iceland we see in this film. Yeah, no, I can't either. They're kind of, it's, it's almost an opposite attract situation, isn't it? I feel like Laura is... Or at least we know that she was formerly kind of chaotic and stuff. And Adja's very um, calm, cool, calm and collected. Mm-hmm. To say she's just been through this humongous life-altering event and been separated from her daughter, she's like incredibly dignified and placid throughout the whole thing. Very much so. And she only sort of lets her emotions show through like a single tear mm-hmm. or at that moment when they're lying down next to each other and she finally reveals to Laura that she's been deported. It takes her a while to get the words out, but she doesn't really, she doesn't break down into tears. She doesn't scream. She just sort of accepts the situation and then goes for the um, the only way out she sees possible. I think that was really well done. I, I mean, both the central performances were amazing mm-hmm. um, in different ways both eminently believable, likeable, but also at times you were like, oh, come on, Lara particularly. Just really, really empathetic. Completely naturalistic as well. The whole thing Mm. looks naturalistic and their performances were very much grounded in reality. There's no melodrama here. They're not going over the top. There's no music trying to dictate how you're supposed to feel. Mm. We're very much just in there with these two characters who are just dealing with reality. Adja. Ah, 
I was the meeting with a lawyer. It was fine. One thing I did notice that perhaps, I, I don't know, but perhaps isn't realistic quite, you know, as much as the rest of it, is the time frame. Mm. I mean, we don't know exactly how much time has passed, but Adja does end up at the refugee centre and then very, very quickly has had her application denied and has been told she's been deported. And the authority figures, or whoever they are, tell her, you may be here for however long we don't know it may take this long to process your application it may take this long until someone comes to pick you up in the middle of the night and send you back home and i'm pretty sure that things don't happen that fast but i think that's the film being quite economical with what it shows time wise because for example when adja goes to prison they're like you're going to prison for 30 days and then the next thing we see is her coming out of prison sure so i think it's picking and choosing and the time for it, and the timeline is a bit compressed at points i don't yes think. although i don't think that they would have been sleeping in her room at the refugee center for very long once she started earning money but also don't you think it's a bit of a it all seems so ad hoc you know it's like well when will this happen don't know could be a week could be yeah. a year when are they going to come get me mm, could be next week could be in a month's time so yeah, it's Part true. It's, it certainly could have happened this way. Absolutely. Um, and for dramatic purposes, yeah. it works quite well to, to make it that short. Mm. And the, the scene where she meets the guy to sort of mm. figure out how she can leave. A smuggler, essentially. Yeah, like getting her on board a container ship inside a shipping container. Mm. I mean, that's full desperation there. Yeah. Well, I I kind of thought if she'd got that far... Then I was interested that she backed out because she was really willing to risk it all. She gave him all her money. She ran in the middle of the night. What do you think it was that made her turn around? Just the risk was too great. I think so. I mean... There was a sleeping bag there. There was a sleeping bag, yeah. Uh, It's a long old trip to Canada from... I was thinking this. How long would it take from Iceland to Canada on a ship? I have no idea how long that would take, but it would be long enough that you wouldn't want to be stuck in that container and the way those containers get moved around and whether Mm. they get opened when you dock like i don't know if you've seen the wire but in season two it basically starts on the dockyard with the stevedores and they discover a a shipping container full of ladies who've been human trafficked across the you know the world and you know it's not um not a nice start to that series and that's kicks the whole thing off but it's entirely possible that she might never get yeah. opened up, might never get seen, or if there's not enough food or water to survive the trip. Yeah, it's a huge risk. It's a massive risk. And then even if she gets to Canada, if they what find happened? her, then she's going to go back to where she was, probably. Um, yeah. I think it's interesting that at one point, Laura spots a book in Adja's mm. room. I didn't I didn't understand the relevance of that. So that book is called Flight and Freedom: Stories of Escape to Canada. So it's something obviously that mm-hmm. Adja was reading and hoped, you know, might I mean it obviously provided some kind of hope. But the first thing I read about that book online is that it's a book about how Canada has deported, denied and diverted many refugees over the years and to me that's not hopeful at all. So even if she had made it to Canada, the chances of her getting to stay, I mean, even <laughs> at the end of the film well yeah i was wondering whether we're going to talk about that it is hopeful and it is a happy ending to the story we've watched but if you think about it beyond what we see i'm not sure that it could it might not be so hopeful yeah and i guess that that uncertainty 
is part of it. So, I mean, the filmmaker, the director could have showed us, shown us anything they wanted. She mm-hmm. could have shown us um, Adja landing in Canada, meeting her daughter again, and everybody's happy. But obviously the decision was made not to show that. Mm-hmm. And I think probably part of that is because to be fair to the reality of the situation that as you say you don't know what that what happens i guess one option would be that she gets caught out at canadian border police but she can claim asylum there potentially yeah they might have a more favorable view of her situation not that she's going to have any more evidence but yeah you're right they might might look on that situation better because that ending we'll get so we might as well talk about the ending mm. So after Adja runs away from that shipping container looking absolutely distraught, thankfully, Laura has followed her uh, because she cares for her and she doesn't want her to do something stupid because they've formed this close bond. And um, we don't see it, but she basically rescues her and takes Mm. her back. And then she comes up with this plan. Mm. Did you see this ending? Did you foresee this ending? I... I wasn't surprised by the ending. Mm -hmm. I thought there's got to be some kind of redemptive situation. So, I, yeah, I wasn't surprised. I'm not sure I would say, oh, I knew from the start that's where it was going to end. Okay. How about you? No, not from the very beginning. But there's the scene where we learn where the passports go, the forged passports. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's coming back They're all in a folder (laughs) in in this back room. In a very accessible (laughs) room. Um, but might be right and obviously Laura is in the right position to move to go into that room and collect said passport just to say I was like as if she wouldn't be on some kind of like red list you know you'd think that anybody who was in a detention center would be on a you know their face would flash up on CCTV and it would say this is don't let them throw potentially yeah. or if a passport you tried to pass it through the system and it got rejected and you were trying to pass it through the system again, you would think... Yeah, you'd think they would place some sort of flag on yeah. that. But does Laura scan it, does she? No, I guess she doesn't scan it. But so she, I mean, she can do what she likes at that point. I can't, I can't be... quite remember the intricacy, but as Adja comes up to her, finally, she can basically just be like, yep, fine, bye. She, no, one's, no one's watching her at that point. Mm. to make sure she's doing a job properly. I don't buy it, but I liked it from a narrative standpoint. It is interesting, isn't it? Because the whole film feels quite, like we're saying, natural and realistic. And then it kind of has to go a little bit filmy. But we needed that ending, don't you think? Next, please. Passport and boarding pass, please. Did you have a nice day? Yes. I mean, I wouldn't have been very happy watching Adja just get sent back to Mm Guinea-Bissau. And that's that. (laughs) That would have been so bleak. I mean, Laura, obviously, her life is on the up. Well, so we said, you know, this ending leaves ambiguous as to what would happen to Adja. You know, does she make it to Canada? If she does, can she claim asylum? Mm -hmm. Does she get reunited with her daughter? Or does she get to Canada and then get deported? Mm -hmm. But I guess it's also a bit ambiguous about Laura. Firstly, that she's obviously, if this is her job, then her job is finding all the people like Adja, Mm -hmm. who, you know, they might not have daughters, but they might have sons or relatives or whatever, and putting them in the same position. Yep. And if that's her job, is she carrying on with that job? Is she giving it up? Because if she gives it up, Will she have to live in a car again? Mm-hmm. There's this, this lots of... Um, Ambiguities. Lots of ambiguity. Just lots of stuff at play. 
that sort of forces these people just in this is the only situation that can happen for adja especially but post that moment we don't know adja might walk through and someone's like laura did you just let her through (laughs) you're fired and she's deported yeah and that's i mean that is totally bleak but thankfully ugadatir didn't show us that so we can think about whatever happy ending we like in my mind adja got to canada she was reunited she got asylum status Mm -hmm. and laura did that job for another month and then because she'd had a permanent job she was able to get a different one and Uh, everybody ended happily maybe she then goes on to set up some sort of organization that helps and aids refugees and actually can come up with the evidence to help them find the stuff. I like that, that we're nice. just inventing a lovely yeah, afterlife. Well, I, actually, I say that. I did, read a, I did read an article from earlier this year about how an immigration counselling centre had opened up in Reykjavik this year. Um, it's not quite the same, obviously, as what we just suggested, but it does prove that people are there trying to help yeah. new people coming to the country um, I mean, this is for people who have decided to come to Iceland and live there and actually don't know what to do. They're there legally. Mm. Um, but it's the sort of thing that Lara could go and do. I think it was really refreshing and nice. I know we've got all the way to the end of the second season before I say this. To see this film just in terms of that it covered quite different ground mm-hmm. to what we've dealt with before. We haven't really had all of the films we've watched have been quite insular really Icelandic and about specifically Icelandic issues. Yeah. And this feels like it's got a much more global scope that it's talking about an issue that affects everybody across the world, really, mm-hmm. in different ways. And also, added to that, we really haven't seen any films with central non-white characters. No. And 100%. obviously we have Adja, but then there are a supporting cast of people who are, you know, the other... Um, asylum seekers and refugees in the center and stuff mm-hmm. so it was nice to see some different people represented completely in Icelandic cinema and obviously a lot of that comes from how you know insular iceland has been historically mm-hmm. um it's only really in the last 20 years that people have even begun to emigrate to iceland and people are seeing it as a place that they can take mm-hmm. refuge as refugees so i think as we move forward it won't just be in stories about those specific people mm-hmm. um, looking for somewhere safe. We will see films featuring non-white characters that aren't specifically refugees mm. um, because the country itself is becoming more diverse just generally, uh, which is great to see. So that would be good, wouldn't it? Mm. Who knows what we'll, who we'll see in series three? <laughs> oh, who knows who we'll see? Probably a lot of familiar faces, though. I think we might, yeah. Who else did we see in this film? Is there anyone you spotted? Ooh. No. Are you going to draw up somebody incredibly obscure now? <laughs> she might not be obscure. We just haven't seen much of her. But... Okay. I mean, we spoke about Hilmir Snar Gunnarsson from 101 Reykjavik popping up as like <laughs> the tiniest character as a yeah. taxi driver in Woman at War. But he's like doing great things right now. Okay. So people pop up in these roles. But the lady who plays Colbrun, who is Laura's sort of... Lover? Lover, I guess. Lover, yeah. Casual lover. Very casual. And then like to the point that she ignores her entirely whenever she's mm. with her husband, which is a bit sad. I said sad a lot. There's a lot of sadness in this film. But Colbrun is played by Solveig Gudmundsdottir, who I don't know if you remember. <laughs> I'm, I don't really. In Let Me Fall, she plays Magnea's stepmother. Do you know what? I do remember her a bit because she got really arsy about a hat, didn't she? She had the hat collection on the wall. Mm. What one was it that went missing? A fez? Was it a fez? It was a fez, <laughs> I think. Well, there you go. You, you never know who's going to appear in these films <laughs> and who might appear as like the lead actor in the next film we discuss. They might have just been a tiny little player. The woman who worked at the supermarket in this film will be the lead in the next. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great podcast series, though. Remember that tiny little <laughs> bit actor? Well, she's lead in this film. <laughs> that would be brilliant.
It's just a nice story, really, of people in desperate situations coming together and being stronger together than they would be apart, which is a lovely message. It is. And this was Isolde Good to Tears' debut feature. Ooh. Which is it's a pretty accomplished Coming in strong. piece of work, isn't it? Yeah. So we're looking forward to what comes next mm-hmm. from her. And while we're at it, I'll just give a shout out to the cinematographer who made this film just mm-hmm. look as bleak as it does, <laughs> uh, but beautifully bleak, who is Ita Zbroniek Zajd. I've definitely got that wrong and I do apologize, but she made it look yeah. fantastic i must say and helped avoid that sort of sense of melodrama which mm. could have made this a, a Schmaltz fest. schmaltzy and weepy which i know i'm quite prone to crying at things like that but actually i'm i'm, ha- I'm happy with the restraint in this film yes it was much. um well judged completely uh so thumbs up all around for this mm-hmm. one great end to the series yeah can't believe we're there <laughs> what two whole series I never thought I'd watch this many Icelandic films. I've gone from zero to hero. Not quite. (laughs) (laughs) If you say so. (laughs) Um, So after two series, I'm going to ask you the big questions. Can I just do it from this series though? Okay, well, we'll do do it from this series first. Yeah, Yeah, you can review each one as as I read them out. So we had Woman at War. Great. Two, I Remember You. Ooh, spooky. That's the word. Three, Noe Albanoe. No, thank you. (gasps) I take offence. Noe, thank you. Dear God. (laughs) Four, Grandma Lo-Fi. Okay, quirky, yeah. Yeah, okay. Five, A White White Day. Oh, moving, but quite intense. Very intense, that one. Bonus episode for Halloween, Reykjavik Whale Watching Massacre. (laughs) 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 And finally, number six, and breathe normally. Really great. Okay. We've heard your brief <sighs> reviews. Do you have a favourite from this can series? Can I have a tie? And can I have an honourable mention? Wow. Which I mean, is that's half. half the series. <laughs> Go for it. Okay. I think my two faves are actually the bookends of the season. Fabulous. So Woman at War and And Breathe Normally. Maybe Woman at War would pip it to the post. Just because I think it was a bit more umphy. Yeah, a bit more umphy. Uh, and a bit more fast paced. Yeah. But Anne Breathe Normally was really beautifully done and well judged and an important message. Yeah. I um, mean, it's very much like they both have this important current political message, but Anne Breathe Normally, in terms of its style and its music and all of that it's very much the antithesis to the to woman at war which is comedic and Mm. bright and just yeah a bit more lively isn't it and my honorable mention goes to spooky i remember you (laughs) which i don't think was i don't think was anywhere near in the leagues of the two we've just talked about in terms of quality but i just always love a spooky ghost child movie Mm mm-hmm how about yeah. you? I'm going to have to put up a defence for Noe Albanese. No! <laughs> <laughs> I was so surprised by that one because I went in thinking this is, I just don't even know what to expect. The cover of the DVD looks atrocious. <laughs> um, but I just really liked its quirkiness. It's properly like black humour. And I guess to an extent I could identify with being a, like a slightly loner An albino. teenager. An albino, yeah. Well, I did get called albino a lot when I was at school as, as a form of bullying because I've got such blonde hair. Yeah. I didn't enjoy that. I mean, I prob- I'm probably closer to a real albino than Thomas Le Marquis. Oh, yeah, that's true. No, the not albino. Not anyway. albino y. <laughs> hmm. Well, you're wrong, but you're entitled to your opinion. Yeah, it's not my favourite film of the series, but I, it needed that mention. I thought I really, really did enjoy it. But yeah, my favourite is Woman at War because it's just brilliant. And Haldora Gerhardstadter is just fantastic. And we will be seeing more of her should we come back for a third series. Bring her back. Bring her back. Bring her back. Okay, well, <laughs> there, <laughs> that's uh, series two of Kvikminderpod done.
There you are, a stunning debut feature from Isol Dugadatir, and we can't wait to see more from her. And from all the actors, directors, writers, cinematographers, musicians, and everyone else who has made the films we covered this series and last so special. We've had a fantastic time watching everything and are hungry for more. Thanks once again for listening and for your support, and we will see you soon. Thank you and goodbye. Tako bless.